Welcome to part 30 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. In this series, we deep dive cases including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, internet mysteries, and more. I upload about five times per week, so make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for a constant stream of high quality content. Stevie Wonder isn't blind. This is a recommendation by community member Zombie101Lover. And remember to comment your suggestions below. The theory that Stevie Wonder is not actually blind has been a topic of fascination amongst many for years at this point and has at this point become a full-blown internet urban legend. This idea originated from a mixture of anecdotal evidence and public appearances that allegedly seem peculiar for someone who is blind. This theory, advocated for by people who I've dubbed Wonder Truthers, suggests that the renowned musician has been faking his blindness for his entire career. The discussion around this topic has been fueled by various instances cited by celebrities, athletes, and internet users. The theory first gained notable attention in 2005 on an online forum where a member mentioned an interview with musician Boy George about Stevie Wonder. In this interview, Boy George humorously recounted an event where Stevie Wonder playfully put his hands around his neck at a party. This prompted forum users to question Wonder's ability to perceive his surroundings. I note that when the theory was first proposed, the theory was not that Stevie Wonder isn't blind, but rather that he is not 100% blind. This incident, amongst others, sparked a widespread online discussion. The narrative further expanded with a YouTube video posted in 2011, showing Wonder apparently reacting to a falling microphone during a performance. This was interpreted by some as evidence of sight, given his apparently quick reaction time. In another video that went viral, Stevie Wonder was being filmed while signing autographs for fans and he turned directly to the cameraman and said, quote, I don't want to see this on TV. Many were curious as to how he knew the location of the cameraman and further questioned his natural usage of the word see in relation to something on TV. Other incidents which have been noted include a video of Stevie Wonder appearing to be behind the wheel of a stationary vehicle. Others, particularly on Twitter, have noted that Stevie Wonder is a basketball fan and frequently shows up sitting courtside. These users question why Stevie Wonder would quote, pay for a courtside seat. Now, I'm no expert on Stevie Wonder's finances, but he's been an A-list star for half a century and is one of the most successful singers in human history. I think he can afford it. And hey, even if he couldn't, he's Stevie Wonder. Who the heck is going to turn Stevie Wonder away from any venue? Many of the arguments presented by proponents of the theory rely on misunderstood aspects of blindness and the abilities of visually impaired individuals. Being blind does not mean a person lacks spatial awareness or that they can't enjoy sports through auditory sensations. Further, being blind doesn't always mean zero sight, but more on this in a moment. The discussions surrounding this theory often reflect misconceptions about disability and the capabilities of those who live with visual impairments. While the exact in-depth details of Stevie Wonder's blindness isn't known, the vast majority of legally blind people retain vestiges of sight, such as the ability to detect light sources. That said, Stevie Wonder was not born blind he was born premature, and his blindness was a consequence of the incubator he was placed in as a newborn. And if you still have any doubt about the truth of Stevie Wonder's blindness, he has taken off his trademark dark shades in public on a couple of occasions, notably his Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. However, it appears that he only takes the shades off on extremely rare occasions. Out of respect for Stevie Wonder, I'm not going to attach photos of him without his sunglasses here, as he appears to only remove them for extremely poignant moments of his choice. Also, just a quick aside, but one of the things I enjoy most about this mystery 
is the fact that Stevie Wonder has so much fun with it as well. For instance, when he told the cameraman he didn't want to see the video on TV, he repeated the line a few times with a smile until the cameraman got the joke. Jeff the Talking Mongoose. On the Isle of Man, a British crown dependency in the Irish Sea, an unusual creature made waves in the United Kingdom in the 1930s. And as you may have guessed by the title of this segment, this creature was a peculiar entity known as Jeff, the Talking Mongoose. And yes, this is one of the most bizarre segments I've done thus far. Also, quick aside for those unaware, the mongoose is a fairly large, weasel-like creature that inhabits large portions of Africa and Asia. So not only was this mongoose an anomaly due to his ability to talk, he was also quite the accomplished traveler, especially in a time before air travel. Jeff is associated with the Irving family, a rather unusual family consisting of Father James, Mother Margaret, and daughter Vori. In September 1931, the Irving family claimed that they heard noises resembling a ferret, a dog, or even a baby coming from their farmhouse. I note that 13-year-old Vori Irving was the first to report incidents with Jeff. According to the Irving's daughter, Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a large bushy tail. It resembled a mongoose, communicated with them in a human-like voice, and displayed an astonishing level of intelligence. Notably, according to Vori, Jeff described himself as a, quote, extra, extra clever mongoose. My experience with mongoose isn't extensive, I'll admit. I've seen one in a zoo once. But in comparison to that mongoose, Jeff was a certified genius. The mysterious creature claimed to have been born in New Delhi in India in 1852 before relocating to the Isle of Man. Also by way of quick historical note, New Delhi wasn't built until 1911, a minor historical error which we can probably attribute to Jeff being a literal mongoose. The Irvings made numerous unusual claims about Jeff and their interactions with him. Further, I note that while initially Jeff had been reported by Vori, James and Margaret also claimed to interact with the mysterious mongoose as well. They claimed that Jeff guarded their house, alerted them of the arrival of people or animals, and extinguished the stove when someone forgot to turn it off. They also claimed that he served as an alarm clock when they overslept. Jeff was perhaps channeling his inner rooster. Or perhaps he actually transformed into a rooster. Because guess what? Jeff the Magic Mongoose could also shapeshift. According to the Irvings, Jeff turned into a cat and hunted mice. Given that mongoose are extremely proficient mouse hunters, I question why he had to become a cat. But who am I to question the wisdom of a shapeshifting magical mongoose? Jeff was paid for his services in the form of cookies, crumpets, and chocolates, as well as the occasional banana, which upon extensive research are items not part of the typical mongoose diet. For reference, the mongoose is famous for its ability to fight and consume venomous snakes. This suggests a potential reason why Jeff immigrated from India to the Isle of Man. He was probably looking for a place with no venomous snakes, Jeff just wanted to enjoy his retirement munching on crumpets and cookies while sipping tea with the Irvings. Fortunately, this story occurred in the 1930s, so there must be photographic evidence of Jeff, right? Well, that's where you'd be wrong. Vori tried photographing him, but Jeff refused to sit still, claiming that he believed the camera to be a trap. Once the story of Jeff broke, others attempted to capture the creature, or at least get a picture of the mystic mongoose. However, despite efforts to capture or photograph Jeff, he remained elusive, only occasionally revealing himself to the Irvings. In terms of theories as to what Jeff the mystical mongoose actually was, there are a number of interesting hypotheses. 
The Irvings maintained that Jeff was a legitimate supernatural mongoose, a theory which attracted numerous supporters at the time. Others have speculated that Jeff was an imaginary friend of Vori, the Irvings' daughter, that in essence took on a life of its own. Under this theory, Jeff wasn't a hoax, but rather a psychiatric condition, which first manifested in Vori, and subsequently spread throughout the family. This theory is supported by the fact that shared psychosis, known more properly as shared delusional disorder, is a real condition. In this condition, one person initially forms a delusional belief during a mental break and through means which are not entirely understood, imposes this belief on a third party. In this instance, the delusions and hallucinations with respect to the magic mongoose infected the family with everyone eventually seeing it and interacting with it. Others have speculated a less extreme form of this suggesting that the parents were induced into a mass hysteria type event related to the mongoose. Under this theory, the parents weren't fully inculcated into the delusion, but experienced some symptoms related to the mongoose and simply went along with it. This theory draws heavily upon a leading contemporaneous hypothesis that the mongoose was a ventriloquist trick pulled off by Vori Another popular theory is that the mystical mongoose was simply a hoax that got out of hand, designed by a bored teenager living on an isolated island. For the next little bit, I'll ask you to put yourself in Vori's shoes. Imagine you're a lonely teenage girl living on an isolated farm on an isolated island. Perhaps you make up the magical talking mongoose to feel special, or perhaps just not so lonely. One day, you tell your parents about your cool new friend, Jeff the mystical mongoose, who immigrated to the island from India. To your shock and surprise, your parents go all in on it. Wow, Vori, a mystical mongoose. This is so utterly believable. We should alert the papers and the authorities. And from there, everyone is kind of just roped into continuing to make up stories about the mongoose in a vain effort to save face. But to get back to the case itself, physical evidence of Jeff's existence was unearthed by investigative journalists. Jeff's supposed hairs were sent for examination, and it was concluded that the hairs resembled those of a long-haired dog. Also, total aside, which I'm inserting here for no reason whatsoever, the Irvings happened to own a big old sheepdog with long hair. Interestingly, a journalist pulled a few hairs from the family's dog and observed that the hairs were identical to Jeff's hairs previously provided by the Irvings. Again, I'm sure this is yet another coincidence. Impressions of Jeff's tooth marks were analyzed along with the claw imprints. Notably, the claw imprints didn't match a mongoose or any known animal. In another truly bizarre coincidence, it was noted that the teeth marks were likely made by a dog. Of course, that can easily be explained away by Jeff shapeshifting into a dog to leave teeth marks. Remember, this is a magical shapeshifting mongoose here. In 1970, British journalist Walter McGraw tracked down Vori Irving and persuaded her into an interview. Vori stated that other children ridiculed her and her family to the point where she had to leave the Isle of Man to escape the ridicule she received. When McGraw asked whether or not Jeff had really been a mongoose, and whether Jeff was real, Vori maintained her story. She admitted that she didn't know if Jeff was actually a mongoose, but she maintained that this is what he told her he was. Further, she maintained that both she and her family had regular talks with Jeff, and that everything about the story was true. Let me know what you think was the cause of the Jeff the Mongoose phenomenon in the comments. Personally, given all the facts, I'm leaning towards this not being a hoax, but more of a shared delusion amongst the Irving family as discussed. Jimmy here, the YouTuber behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. 
My goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you all along for the ride. Consider signing up for a YouTube membership or joining the Patreon. Your support allows me to dedicate a very large amount of my time to content creation. Also remember to join the Discord community. We're nearing 70 members now and the community is super active. Click the link in the description. The Disappearance of Loretta Ann Frank The disappearance of Loretta Ann Frank in late 1988 or early 1989 in Whitehorse in the Yukon Territory in Canada remains an extremely troubling case for a number of reasons. Also, as a quick aside, she preferred to go by Laura with her friends and family, so I'll be referring to her as Laura from here on out. Her case underscores systemic issues related to the treatment of Indigenous women in Canada, as well as systemic issues related to individuals suffering from mental health concerns. Laura, a 19-year-old Indigenous woman, was known for her shy and pleasant disposition and struggled with schizophrenia since her teenage years. She had moved from Lower Post, British Columbia, to Watson Lake, Yukon, and later to Whitehorse, in search of better psychiatric care and social services. Her move was marked by challenges, including the lack of consistent psychiatric care in Watson Lake, and her struggle to find happiness and stability in Whitehorse. While in Whitehorse, she was able to obtain employment as well as access some basic social services, both of which were lacking in Watson Lake. Notably, she was treated by a changing cast of traveling psychiatrists and was unable to ever build up a working relationship with any specific individual. Over Canadian Thanksgiving weekend in 1988, Laura visited her family in Watson Lake, expressing a desire to move back due to her unhappiness in Whitehorse. Despite her family's concerns about the lack of resources in Watson Lake, she returned to Whitehorse, after which her family lost all contact with her. Rumors suggested Laura might have been involved with a man from Haines, Alaska, but no substantial information ever emerged about this relationship. Unfortunately, no verified sightings of her have occurred since she went missing, leaving more questions than answers. Her family's search was met with frustration and apathy, as early reports to the police were seemingly dismissed. Notably, her sister-in-law reported Laura missing virtually immediately, and the local RCMP detachment advised her she was a runaway. Numerous follow-ups were made with local authorities with Laura's friends and family, insisting that she had not run away. In a disgraceful move, despite constant reporting of Laura's disappearance, the police didn't officially acknowledge her disappearance until 1993. This initial delay hampered the ability for any meaningful progress into her disappearance and just showed a level of extreme apathy towards an extremely vulnerable young woman. In an unfortunate turn of events, despite overwhelming evidence of early reports as to Laura's disappearance, an RCMP spokesperson maintained as late as 2015 that no report was made. Instead, this spokesperson advised that no file was opened until 1993, completely missing the point that Laura's family had been repeatedly turned away when trying to report her missing. The case remains open, and if you have any information, I encourage you to reach out to the Yukon Detachment of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Also, I note that while it sounds futile to suggest reaching out to an organization which failed Laura initially, this is the investigative agency handling the case. As a quick aside, I'm extremely heartened to see that Laura Frank's family and her community have kept her story in the news for over 30 years. They continue to hold out hope for her return, as do I, and as I'm sure everyone else hearing her story now does too. The Northern Land of Hyperborea Hyperborea, a concept steeped in ancient Greek mythology, has fascinated scholars for millennia. This mythical land, believed to lie far to the north of Greece, was described as a paradise beyond the domain of Boreas, the god of cold northern winds and winter. 
In Hyperborea, the sun is said to shine 24 hours a day, and the inhabitants live in unparalleled bliss for extremely long periods of time. Further, the Greeks depicted Hyperboreans as a race of giants. The first detailed account of Hyperborea comes from Hesiod, an ancient Greek poet who painted a picture of a utopian society. Hesiod's account is ancient even by Greek standards, coming from the 8th century BC. Hyperborea was often associated with Apollo, the Greek god of the sun, music, and poetry. The Hyperboreans were described as devout worshippers of Apollo, sending him gifts, and in return, they enjoyed a peaceful existence free from the hardships of war and disease. The connection between Apollo and Hyperborea was deeply ingrained in Greek mythology, with legends stating that Apollo himself would visit Hyperborea during the winter months. The geographical location of Hyperborea was a subject of much speculation among ancient authors. Some identified it with Britain, suggesting that the mysterious land lay beyond the land of the Celts and was characterized by its fertile land and temperate climate. Notably, Britain has a climate that is remarkably well suited to agricultural society, though the island is famously not incredibly sunny. Other writers propose different locations with the suggestion that Hyperborea lay beyond the Ural Mountains. More fantastical notions placed Hyperborea at the very edges of the world, including suggestions that it was located in the Arctic regions. Herodotus, the father of recorded history, mentioned the land but expressed skepticism about its existence, a sentiment echoed by later scholars and historians. Notably, Herodotus was the first known person in the Western world to attempt to portray history as based on evidence, rather than based upon conjecture and mixtures of mythology. As such, his doubts about the existence of Hyperborea had a significant effect upon all subsequent historical and geographical analyses of this supposed region. Despite these doubts, the legend of Hyperborea persisted, with various cultures beyond the Greeks mentioning similar utopia-like northern environments. Fearsome Critters The phenomenon of fearsome critters originated in the folklore and tall tales of North American lumberjacks in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, particularly around the Great Lakes region. These creatures, while rarely sighted or reported at present, laid the foundation for modern cryptid sightings and definitely deserve more attention. These mythical creatures were part of the oral tradition within logging camps, used for entertainment as a means to pass the time and to haze newcomers. The tales were characterized by a mix of humor, exaggeration, and the fantastical, with creatures often possessing bizarre and exaggerated physical traits or abilities. Physical descriptions of fearsome critters often included exaggerated features such as oversized teeth, claws, and horns. Behavioral traits attributed to these creatures varied widely, though they were often portrayed as being more active at dusk, dawn, and at night. A variety of fearsome critters have been cataloged in folklore, each with its own unique story. For example, the agropelter, a kind of horrifying ape-bear hybrid was said to amuse itself by hurling twigs and branches at unsuspecting lumberjacks. Another fearsome critter, the axe handle hound reputedly fed on unattended axe handles, perhaps serving as a warning to new loggers not to leave their equipment unattended. However, perhaps the most well-known fearsome critter at present is the jackalope which for those unfamiliar is a jackrabbit with antelope horns. The origins of these critters can be traced back to a blend of Native American legends, European folklore brought by settlers, and the creativity of the lumberjacks themselves. For instance, the jackalope is theorized to be based upon the Volpertinger, a very similar creature from German Alpine folklore. Despite their fictional origins, 
fearsome critters hold an important place in the study of folklore and cryptozoology. Importantly, much like modern day cryptids, sightings of fearsome critters were routinely reported back in the day. This suggests that many of the lumberjacks who initially heard these stories believed them, or at the very least, weren't entirely sure that the creatures described weren't real. Further, my personal theory on cryptids is that they become quote unquote real when people begin to truly believe in them and cite them. This applies to cryptids that have a known fictional origin as well, rather than a vague mythological origin. Once the belief in the creature is extinguished, so too is its status as a cryptid. And to illustrate my example, let's look at the axe handle hound for a moment. As of right now, there are precisely zero sightings of axe handle hounds every year. But let's say later this year a horror movie about an axe handle hound comes out and the movie becomes a cultural sensation, leading to a series of movies about this purported cryptid. Heck, let's spice it up even more and add in the element that knowledge of the axe handle hound has been suppressed by the government. Now give it a couple years, and I guarantee there will be kids who are afraid to go on a wilderness hike with their parents because their friends claim to know someone who encountered one. And at that point, what's the difference between an axe handle hound report and a report of any other cryptid? The Dai Darabachi. The Dai Darabachi is a fascinating yokai from Japanese folklore embodying the colossal and the mysterious. This yokai, or supernatural creature, is depicted as a giant of such immense proportions that its actions have profoundly shaped the landscape of Japan. During previous discussions of yokai in this series, we've learned that most of these creatures, despite appearing ancient, are actually from the Edo period starting in the 17th century. The Daidarabachi, on the other hand, is actually an ancient tradition, with the first known written record of it being from the 8th century AD. The Daidarabachi belongs to a class of yokai that are so large, they are often mistaken for mountains, or are believed to have created lakes and ponds with their footprints. Various regions in Japan have their own tales and local names for Daidarabachi, underscoring the widespread cultural impact of this mythological giant. The lore surrounding it suggests that many of Japan's geographical features were formed by it laying down to rest or walking. Other local traditions suggest that small mountains are actually sleeping ones, which have become covered with vegetation. I note that given the ancient origins of this yokai, this creature also provides insight into early Japanese history. For instance, there's an early story from the mid portion of the first millennium AD, which indicates that a Daidarabachi physically went to Korea and brought additional land and people to Japan. I note that this story is interesting from a historical perspective because the Yayoi people, who ended up forming the majority of Japan's population, originally came from the Korean Peninsula. These people are speculated to have come over to the Japanese archipelago between 300 BC and 300 AD, wherein they began to displace and integrate the native Jomon peoples. This suggests to me that this yokai may have been created partly out of the cultural memory of this migration. Remember to check out the Patreon and the YouTube membership. The lowest tier of YouTube membership is just 99 cents. Also, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you haven't done so already. Like I said, I put out content constantly, and you don't want to miss it. Also, once you're done this video, click the full tier playlist. Seriously, there's dozens of hours of content now. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Iced Mocha, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, Jeffer Metcalf, Z Volts, Director Delta, Unknown Delusions, and Blasphemous. Big shout out to YouTube members Jordan All and Syntax Nexus. And for everyone else, I love you all, and I'm so happy to have you here.
I've really gotten so many positive, amazing comments lately, and I feel so fortunate that you all allow me into your lives. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Peace out, everyone.